My name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog with PlutocracyFiles.com. I'm Dean Baker. I'm the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, D.C. Great. And the author of several books um, as Most well. recent. Go on. Yes. Most recently, The End of Loser Liberalism, Making Markets Progressive, which people could just download from our website at no cost, which is uh, www.cepr.net. Great. And you also have a blog that I saw you were already posting away at this morning. Yes, Beat the Press, which is uh, a blog of media criticism of uh, media coverage of economic issues, which I try to update daily. Yeah, well, that can keep you busy. It does. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of which, I actually thought before we started on some of the bigger issues, um, well, maybe this is as big of an issue as there is, um, I would mention the recent CBO report regarding inequality um, and also the kind of criticisms that are coming out regarding it. I think you recently took on the David Brooks argument um, that there is, you know, two different types, you know, he kind of called it a blue inequality and a red inequality and claimed that there was an education gap and the, so that the, what was important was this education gap as, a, as opposed to the 1%. Um, and you took that on, Paul Krugman took it on, Paul Krugman's column today actually, I think, is directed pretty much directly at that argument as well. Um, but I thought maybe you could discuss sure. that. Sure. I mean, it, what's striking, the Congressional Budget Office report really doesn't give anything new because there's been a lot of research on this topic over the last, well, 15 years or so. I could think of uh, many papers being written on it. But what was nice is con the Congressional Budget Office is sort of quasi-official. So when they say something, it sort of makes it true. Right. And what they showed was that we've had this huge upward redistribution of, uh, of income over the last three decades that overwhelmingly has gone to the top 1%, and particularly if you want to be more precise, the top 10 of 1%. But it's a story where um, basically almost everyone down the income ladder has seen very little by way of income growth over the last three decades. When you get to the top 10%, they've seen something, but not very much. Percent or income shares by eight, per, by eight percentage points, which is just huge. It's nearly doubled their income shares. Whereas there was a very modest increase, if you look at the 90th to the 99th percentile, they had some increase in shares. You could talk about that, but it wasn't that big an increase. And then everyone else either stayed the same or went down uh, when you take the bottom half. Um, so what what's happened is that you've had this effort to try to belittle this, and David Brooks being a, a big part of that, obviously, as a prominent uh, pundit New York Times columnist, and he was saying, well, what's really going on is that we have, uh, his term was red inequality, the gap between college and non-college educated. And, of course, there is a gap. There's always been a gap, but that's not news. I mean, there's a uh, college degree has a premium. That premium increased in the 80s, increased a little bit in the 90s, not very much. But you know, what I wrote and Krugman picked up on was that this is kind of old news. I mean, yes, there was an increase in the college high school gap, um, but that that was primarily, as I say, an early 80s story, a little bit more in the 90s. Actually, 90s, people did gain up and down the income ladder. But the inequality we've seen over the last 10 years has been overwhelmingly the 1%, and even prior to that, it was mostly the 1%. So it's really kind of a distraction to focus on college, non-college. Again, there, there's an issue there. We should want, at least I want, I think it's good more people get educated. That's a good thing. Uh, education is valuable in itself. And in general, someone gets a college degree, they'll get higher income than someone who doesn't have a college degree. All that's well and good. But that's really not the story that you know people are talking about, and they're not being diluted. There's been this huge upward redistribution of income. And the fact that you have people like Brooks and many others who just you know don't want us to talk about that, well, that's a distraction. This is huge. 8% of GDP. 8% of national income is huge. And, you know, one of the comparisons, I was going to do a column on this over the weekend, one of the comparisons, we have these people running around like chickens with their head cut off over Social Security. You know, Social Security faces a shortfall, it's going to go bankrupt, blah, 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 blah. The upward redistribution of income to the top 1% is about 14 times the projected shortfall in Social Security. So, you know, I always say in Washington, you know, you have a lot of people who are more prominent, more powerful than me. And I always say, well, I can't tell them they're wrong, but I could tell them if they say one thing one day, I'm going to hold them to it the next day. And right. if Social Security shortfall is a big deal, then the 
in the upward redistribution to the top 1% is 14 times a big deal. So right. it's worth our talking about. Right. And it seems that it's kind of, you know, I'm seeing more, there's kind of a income inequality denialism that seems to be popping up um, in quite a few sectors. Yeah, I mean, there's other ways people, uh, there, there's a piece uh, in the Post by, uh, I think it's Richard Gerson, one of their columnists, who said, oh, the issue isn't inequality, it's mobility. And you go, well, that's fine, but there's very low mobility, too. So, you know, you could right. you could play games. I mean, there, there, there have been some studies, I remember, I'm going to do this again, where they show that people who are in the bottom quintile in, uh, you know, one five-year period, a very high percent are in the fourth or fifth quintile, you know, the next period. Well, the way you do that is by you taking students, you know, so guess what? You know, law students or med students don't do very well when they're they don't have a lot of income. You know, when they're in school. You know, five years later when they're practicing lawyers or doctors, well, then they're much wealthier. I, I mean, there's just silly things like that that you see people do. But the reality is that both we have much greater inequality than we did three decades ago, and we also have much less mobility. And the idea that the U.S. is just this incredibly mobile society—that's actually not true. There's a lot of studies that have shown that. Um, the Scandinavian uh, societies are much greater mobility between quintiles. In fact, it, comparing us to the European, uh, the continent as a whole, we're right about the middle. We're not, we're not one of the most mobile. We're not the least, so you could say that. But, you know, we have much more inequality than anyone else. And given that we don't have more mobility, that's a pretty bad mix. Right. Um, okay, so to kind of to kind of back up a little bit, I did want to talk to you about housing um, at some point, but I wanted to start with um, I've asked several economists the same question, which is, what would be their priorities for dealing with the economy? And by that, I mean to include both the short-term jobs crisis and also, um, you know, longer-term issues. Uh, such as, you know, the structural problems with the financial sector, uh, environmental issues, et cetera. So bearing all of that in mind, if we weren't so insane and focused on austerity and things like this, if there weren't the political uh, impediments, what would be your priorities for our current situation? Well, getting people back to work really has to be, you know, the, the bottom line. And, you know, it's it's just incredible, you know, I'm speaking to someone who's in the Washington debate, that how, you know, jobs have just kind of fallen off the agenda. You know, we have these people running around yelling about the tax code, yelling, you know, as though people are suffering because they're paying too much in taxes when taxes are at their lowest level since before World War II. Um, we're yelling about the the uh, short the, the deficit, the budget deficit, and I, I'm just I, I had a staffer from a progressive member of Congress, in fact, one of the most progressive members of Congress, call me up uh, earlier in the week, and he's saying, "Tell me the argument that there won't be a disaster if the super committee doesn't come to an agreement." And I, I was a little at a loss because I was going, I, "I don't know the argument there would be a disaster." But apparently over on the Hill, you know, they're, they're like, oh, my God, if the super committee doesn't come to a budget agreement, then I don't even know. You know, something really horrible happens. I'm not quite sure what it's supposed to be. But, you know, my point is that they're, they're looking at these things that are, you know, basically nonsense from my vantage point at a time when we really do have a crisis with, you know, 26, 27 million people unemployed, underemployed, out of the workforce altogether. And for these people, it's just kind of a joke. You know, th these are families being ruined. You know, families break up. Kids you know, aren't being brought up properly because their parents can't afford to, you know, make sure that they have, you know, decent food and clothing and people are being thrown out of their houses. You know, this getting people back to work has to be the first priority. So how do you do that? Um, well, you know, it's going to cost money. And the fact is we have money, you know, as much as you have people running around saying we're broke, the markets say we're not. We can borrow money very, very cheaply. And what we should be doing, some simple things, one, get money to state and local government so they don't have to lay people off. We just had the new jobs numbers. I think it was 24,000 uh, state and local workers lost their jobs this month. So, you know, best way to, you know, surest way, I should say, to, to keep people employed is don't lay them off. You know, so that's a great start. Um, other things, you know, unemployment, uh, it, it, the young people have just been decimated in this downturn. Uh, employment among teenagers is down by about 25% from what it was before the uh, before the recession began. Um, I don't see a downside to having youth job programs. I mean, you have youth unemployment rate nationwide at 25% uh, among uh, African Americans, it's close to 50%. Um, what, what's the downside of having jobs programs where you know, simple things that, you, you know, they'll clean up the parks, their neighborhoods will board up abandoned buildings, things like that. 
um, give people a chance because they, they, they clearly they're they're not going to get jobs right now. You know, it's just absurd when you have places with unemployment rates among teens of over 50 percent. They're not going to be getting jobs. So that seems a real kind of simple common sense thing. Another thing we could do that, again, to my mind, is kind of simple common sense is uh, promote uh, work sharing that uh, encourage firms that instead of laying people off, they simply reduce their hours. Um, and this basically is just saying right now we give people unemployment insurance, have a good time with conservatives, and they go, oh, you want to give people money, blah, blah, blah. You go, look, we're giving them money now for not working. Maybe you don't like unemployment insurance, but we have it. So, you know, rather than paying people not to work altogether, what's wrong with paying them to work shorter hours? So if they get a 20% cut in hours, how about we make up half of that? You know, that's basically the UI formula, unemployment insurance formula. We pay them roughly half their benefit, half their wage. So that would could go a long way, and the great model here is Germany, where they've used that very aggressively, and their unemployment rate today is actually lower than it was at the start of the, the, the downturn, and that's even though their growth's been just about exactly the same as the U.S., uh, so it's not that they've had some big boom there. It's basically, you know, trivially different. It, it's simply that they've kept people at work rather than laying them off. So those would be three things. Now, you'd asked about the longer term, and, you know, one of the things that President Obama tried to do, I don't think he got that far, was to wed environmental concerns to employment. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the, one of the parts of his uh, stimulus package, not a big part, but a part of it, was to promote conservation, to promote uh, um, retrofitting buildings, both uh, private homes, public buildings, businesses, it makes an awful lot of sense because one, they'll have long-term benefits. Two, the worst unemployment is among construction workers. So this is great. We don't need the construction workers to build homes right now because we have a glut of homes. So why don't we use them to, to retrofit homes? Um, so that was a very good program. It, I think, wasn't big enough. It's mostly ended, I believe. There's some part, there might still be some money in the bank on that. But for the most part, I think that's ended. But that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'd love to see us be more aggressive on things like that. One of the things uh, that, that I and others uh, have tossed out, suppose we made bus fares free for a period of time. We paid cities, you know, let people take the buses free. Um, that way you don't, uh, buses will be much quicker. You know, you don't have people coming in there fumbling through their pockets to get the right change and everything. And maybe we'll get some people in the habit of it permanently. And that it also is a character of stimulus because, you know, if people aren't spending 10 bucks a week on the bus or 20 bucks, it might be in many cases, um, that's money in their pocket and they're likely to spend that. So there are things we could do that would both uh, have short term benefits in terms of employing people and longer term benefits in, in terms of, you know, making us more energy efficient. I should also mention infrastructure projects. I didn't, uh, that's usually on my list, but uh, um, for whatever reason, I, I didn't put the top there, but uh we obviously need to retrofit our, our infrastructure as a whole, promote things like trains, high-speed trains that are much more fuel efficient than cars or, or planes. And, you know, again, this technology um, been in existence in Europe, Japan for 40 years. Uh, it's about time we caught up a little bit. So there's a lot of things we can and should be doing to get people back to work that we've just basically dropped the ball. Yeah. Um, and I have reference several times in these interviews that uh, Mike Consul had done um, a Venn diagram regarding the various arguments that economists had made for getting us out of the short-term jobs crisis. And he actually did two Vens, one of which was a supply side argument that were the kind of crowding out uncertainty folks. Uh, but then he did a separate Venn for the demand siders, which I think you fall on the demand side of the equation. And yeah. the three the three circles of the Venn, he had fiscal stimulus, which is what you've been talking about, monetary stimulus, and then debt restructuring. And he was, I think, talking almost exclusively about mortgage restructuring. Uh, and so would you support, and most of the people I've talked to have said that they support all three of those aggressively at this point. Um, some with different kinds of priorities, like John Quiggin said that he would support uh, fiscal stimulus as a priority over the others, but that he supports all three. Where Would you be also in the middle of that, Ben? 
Well, I, I'd support all three. Uh, you know, again, I think fiscal stimulus is the best route. Um, I'd add a fourth there, which is really the long term. What we have to do is get the dollar down to get our trade deficit closer to balance. So I, oh. I, that really, I'll have to talk to Mike about it. He should have that on his list. Cause that yes. Really should, um, but uh, the Fed certainly can and should do more. You know, it, it, I compare the Fed to the ECB, and we're lucky to have the Fed rather than the European Central Bank running the monetary policy for us, but it certainly could be more aggressive. It could target a higher rate of inflation, which would get real interest rates down and would help on the debt restructuring issue. I don't I don't see debt restructuring so much as a as a stimulus story though. I think there's a lot of confusion on that. We had a we had a lot of consumption that was driven by the housing bubble. That's not coming back. We shouldn't want it to come back. It's not going to come back. So the idea that people aren't spending because they're heavily indebted, well that's somewhat true. But they were way overspending before because they thought they had all this money in their house, and that meant that they weren't putting anything aside for their retirement because the house was doing it for them. Well, that's not going to happen. It's not going to. That money's not coming back. So I think you know we should be looking at ways to try and keep people in their home. My personal favorite is uh, living, giving them the right to stay there as renters following a foreclosure, paying the market rent for say five years. Um, Ireland just adopted that. Um, so that's my personal favorite. But you know, I see that more as a matter of how do we help people who are in a really bad situation. That's really not going to be stimulus. And I think the people who are looking at that as stimulus, um, you know, not to say there won't be some effects. Certainly there will be some positive effect, but that's really not a big part of the downturn. Hmm. Yeah, I think that that's generally the story I was hearing, that the kind of um, debt overhang is the word that you'll hear or balance sheet recession, these types of things, and that if we could – you know, that that's a big part of what's holding demand back. So that's interesting that you have a different Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of sloppiness in the thinking on that. People just really weren't looking at it very closely. If you look at our consumption relative to income, it's actually still fairly high. Um, historically, the savings rate had been around 8%, and then it began to fall first because of the stock bubble in the 90s, and then even more so because of the housing bubble. The savings rate he actually fell to zero. Uh, back in 04, 05, 06 at the peak of the bubble. Now it's around 5%. So it's still the savings rate, which means the, 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 the lower savings, the higher consumption. I mean, it's definitional. Right. Um, so, so the, the fact that we have a relatively low savings rate suggests that to me that we're likely to see, uh, consumption go lower relative to income rather than higher. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, I don't consider that a bad thing in the long run because people need to save for retirement. I mean, all they have is their Social Security, and I'm the hugest fan of Social Security around. But nonetheless, I'd like to see most people have something in addition to their Social Security, and they're not going to if they're not saving. So um, I don't uh, – the idea that we should expect consumption and savings rates to fall back to, you know, 2004, 5, 6 levels, um, there's no reason to expect that. That was driven by a housing bubble. That bubble's gone. And it wouldn't be good if it did happen. Hmm. Interesting. So, okay, I, I hadn't heard also the suggestion about the renter. Um, and would that be, so they're allowed to rent it for a period? Do they Are they allowed to buy it? Are they given the opportunity to buy it back after that? Well, under the proposal in Ireland, they wouldn't necessarily be given the, the opportunity. Um, I, you know, I've, when I was pushing, and there was actually a bill introduced in Congress by Raul Grijalva from, uh, from Phoenix, I believe it is, from Arizona. I think it's Phoenix. could be Tucson. And then uh, Marcy Captors from uh, Toledo, Ohio. Um, that just gave them the right to stay as renters for five years. Now, as, as a practical matter, what I would expect is that for most people who actually did that, they stayed in the home. You know, obviously, you're not obligated to do that. But if you opted to stay there and you paid your rent, um, it's hard to believe why wouldn't they want to sell it to you? I mean, you know, why would you then turn around? Why would the bank then turn around and go, oh, we're going to, you know, get a realtor, go through all these costs of finding someone to buy it rather than right. just selling right. it to the person who's already there? So if you could get a requirement that they get that option, I think it would be great. I was mostly thinking, you know, what's the simplest thing that, you know, might possibly see the light of day? And that struck me as, you know, let's just get that they have the right to stay there as renters. Right. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting idea. I hadn't heard about it. Uh, the one I most consistently, um, I guess, most consistently heard recommended is cram down, bankruptcy cram down. 
That's that's a, I think also a very good idea, you know, because basically the reason why I like about both of those is it gives it, it gives the homeowner rights and bankruptcy cram down. I think people do exaggerate perhaps what it would actually accomplish because it doesn't mean people will be able to stay in their home. I mean, bankruptcy mm-hmm. judges aren't known to be you know really sweet guys and women, you know, so you know they in many cases they might do a cram down that allows people to stay, but they're not obligated to do that. So the assumption that people would end up being able to stay in their home is not necessarily true. But the point is it does give a, a big uh, bargaining chip to to the homeowner in dealing with the bank because they could say, look, I'm going to go into bankruptcy. I don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. So, you know, right. let's get serious about doing a modification that lets me stay in my home. Otherwise, we go into bankruptcy and we spin the die and dice and we see who wins. Um, so that's the sort of thing I really like because when you go to these modifications like what we have with AMP, well, you know, there's this happens, that happens. It doesn't, there's no rights to the homeowner under AMP. You know, if, right. if it works, the bank gives them a modification, they could stay in their home, great. But there's no rights there. And as we know, uh, it's not turned out very well for homeowners in, in the vast majority of cases. Right. Yeah. My understanding um, is that HAMP was really, because it was a voluntary program, was really designed, you really needed to have the cram down as kind of a hammer there, that that's what was going to incent banks to make the deal is the fact that they could, is that they would be rolling the dice on a potential cram down. So then when the cram down didn't happen, there was no incentive really. That's right. So basically, you know, from the bank's vantage point, they're going to try to get as much money as they can out of people, and they're not going right. to make modifications if they think that uh, people could keep paying their mortgages, and, you know, they'll try and squeeze what they can out, and that's, that's certainly been the experience. It certainly seems to have been the experience. Right. So what's your take on HARP 2, which is Obama's most recent um, mortgage restructuring program? Well, I think it's helpful. I mean, the basic story there is that you have – people who are in many cases severely underwater or for whatever other reason they haven't been able to refinance and basically this will remove a lot of the obstacles and this is just for people who have their mortgages through Fannie and Freddie. It's about half of all mortgages so it's not a small group of people and that will allow a lot of these people to refinance from higher interest loans to lower interest. You have people that might have been paying six, six and a half percent in some cases. This could allow them to refinance. Uh, I haven't looked at the rates lately, but they had been around four, two, four, three. So might, might allow people to shave as much as two percentage points off a mortgage. That's certainly a good thing. You know, the only thing I could say is, God, you know, why weren't they doing this sooner? Um, you know, but right. it's, it's, it, it's a good thing in my view. Good. Um, my console early on had suggested things for the Occupy Wall Street movement um, to, he put them in terms of demands and subsequently the demand, we want to avoid the demands word, but just in terms of uh, brainstorming ideas about what to do. And the three that he suggested Probably. were canceling the debt, um, holding Wall Street accountable, so having some prosecutions on Wall Street. And then the third, which you've written about, um, is a financial transactions tax. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on all three of those. I think we've already talked about kind of the cancel the debts idea, at least with respect to the home ownership, but the other two. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of prosecutions, I would love to see that because, you know, it's almost certain that there were crimes committed. I mean, this should be investigated and treated seriously. You know, you think of all the people who are in jail for, in many cases, you know, relatively minor crimes. And you could argue whether they should be in jail or not. But the point is, in this case, you had people who were almost certainly committing fraud that, you know, they you had on a massive scale mortgages being issued based on false information, which in many cases, the FBI has looked at this, that in, in most cases, it was the sellers. It was not the buyers who, who did it. You know, not to say every buyer was honest. Surely many were not. But in in, in most cases, this was a uh, analysis by the FBI back in 04. It was the sellers who were initiating it. And I recall during the housing bubble, because I was writing about this, of course, back in 04, 05, 06, I was having people sending me emails from around the country telling me about, you know, their friend or their cousin who worked for Countrywide or, or AmeriQuest, you know, the big subprime issuers. And they, they were 
they were being told to fill in numbers for people. So someone comes in and they want to borrow 400000 and their income's 50000 Well, you can't do that with an income of 50000 so they put down it was 150000 They were doing it. It was the, you know, they were being told. You had the mortgage agents being told to do that. And, right. you know, the fact that this seemed to have been d- done on a fairly large scale does suggest that this was, you know, fraud at a high level. So did it go to the very top? Did you know, countrywide Angela Mazzella now, who knows, you know, but clearly some people fairly high up there knew about this going on because it's going on on such a large scale. For them not to know about it, you'd have to think they're morons, and I really doubt any of these people are morons. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that if we want to have confidence in our system, we have to think that if you do fraud on a large scale, you face prosecution for it. And, you know, for whatever reason, the Justice Department has been unwilling to go that route. So, I think that's a very important thing. You know, I don't know the statute of limitations. We're probably up against it in many cases. But, you know, in insofar as uh, that's still possible, I would love to see it done because I think people would really like to see some justice there. A lot of people are, are suffering because of this. And the people who, who are responsible, you know, in some cases, they're going to be incredibly wealthy for the rest of their lives. And that's just not right. You, you shouldn't be able to get incredibly wealthy by committing massive fraud. Um, the other part... Uh, Financial speculation tax, uh, this is something I've been a big fan of for a long time. Basic point is very simple, that uh, it, the issue here is having a small tax. Uh, the, there's a rate being proposed in Congress smaller than I like. It's very small. It's uh, just three hundredths of a percent. But I'd like to see it be a little higher. But whatever you get, the idea is to have a small tax on, on trades of stock, bonds, options, futures, credit default swaps, other financial instruments like that. That would be of almost no consequence to people who are getting these, you know, getting a stock to, you know, part of an investment for their kid's college or their own retirement. You know, m- most of us who own some stock, I have a 401k, man, I- I'm not looking to trade. I, you know, I'm going to hold it till I retire. You know, it's not, uh, I don't really want to trade. Um, so for, for people who are looking to buy and hold, there'll be very little consequence. And in fact, since most of us don't even manage our own money, you know, I have a mutual fund in my 401k. I don't know what they're doing exactly. I'd expect them to trade less if, um, if it costs more to trade and it might end up being pretty much a wash. In other words, the transactions tax will raise the cost of trading, but you trade less, it ends up being pretty much a wash. So that's, you know, that's what it looks like for most people, most normal investors, but for people who are speculating, people who are buying at one o'clock, selling at two o'clock, or in some cases buying the same minute that they sell, you know, that they, they make their money on very uh, fast trading. Um, this would be a very expensive tax. And some estimates I've done is that, you know, again, depending where you, where you set the tax rate, you could raise as much as 150 billion a year on it. And they're, they're considering a tax in, in the European Union. And their estimates are that the tax levels they're proposing would raise somewhere in the order of 70 to 80 billion dollars a year. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is a potentially very big source of money when you're having discussions in Congress that they want to cut Social Security, they want to cut Medicare. You know, it's pretty hard to say why on earth shouldn't this be in the mix? And as I say, it's a case where um, the, you get, you know, it's kind of a twofer that both the benefit, the, the tax would directly have benefits in to my mind, improving the quality of financial markets. And then also, you know, as a side effect, we get an awful lot of money. Right. Right. So, okay, so you would be for that. Um, and you, you kind of brought up Europe, and I've seen that you've written about the new ECB head and the fact that he didn't um, he didn't mention... Um, the austerity policies and how devastating, you know, I think Krugman referred to it as the European death loop, you know, that they have been, you know, pursuing austerity policies, which has led to less revenues, which then they need further austerity policies, and it's just getting worse and worse in Europe, and they seem to be just headed for disaster. Yeah, you know, the, the issue, and I, I'll be hopeful about the new uh, Mario Draghi, the new head of the European Central Bank. He just came in this week, and, you know, let's hope for the best with him. But but the, the, the story there is that you, you have Greece, which everyone now concedes is a basket case. They're going to have to write down a substantial portion of the debt, meaning that the, right. currently the deal they're talking about is 50%, so that the banks, the creditors, will take 50 cents on a dollar for their debt. 
and then you know they'll come through with additional money to to allow them to pay the the debt after that, which is still going to be a lot. It's still going to be very high relative to their uh, the size of their economy. But the big problem for Europe, uh, Greece is a, in the scheme of things a relatively small country. Uh, right. The big problem for Europe, of course, is that you have other heavily indebted countries, small ones like Ireland and Portugal, but then relatively large ones like Spain and particularly now Italy. And what what clearly has to happen in the case of those countries, most importantly Italy, is that there has to be some sort of guarantee from presumably the European Central Bank that they're going to guarantee the debt of, uh, of, of the country. Because if they don't, then they look at very high interest rates and... If you have a high debt with high interest rates, it quickly becomes unsustainable. And that's the situation that Italy's on the edge of falling into. So if there's not a commitment from the European Central Bank to guarantee Italian debt, you run this risk that basically things just unwind. People start running from the debt. Interest rates get higher and higher. And then at that point, there's, it, it becomes impossible to keep Italy from defaulting. And if Italy defaults, as I say, Greece could default, they're able to deal with that. It's a big deal. It's not trivial because banks are taking a big hit, as they should. I mean, they made bad bets, and they're supposed to pay the price for that. Um, so, so they are doing that to some extent. But if you talk about that with Italy, which it has debt that's about five times as much as what Greece has outstanding, that's a really big haul. So it will be a very, very messy situation if the European Central Bank doesn't step up and come up with some sort of plan that involves basically a guarantee of the debt of Greece, I'm sorry, Italy, Spain, um, less important, but also presumably part of the mix, Ireland and, and, and Portugal. And if they don't do that, uh, they're looking at an unwinding of the, the euro, and it's it runs the risk of creating a Lehman-type situation worldwide where you get you know, basically a financial freeze up as we had in the fall of 08, uh, which, you know, no one's going to escape. I mean, obviously Europe will be hit by it the worst or the Eurozone countries by it the worst, but no one's going to escape that unscathed. So, you know, people are concerned about a double dip here. That's a double dip. Um, that will be a very, very bad story. And, and do you think that, well, you're saying that you're hopeful that the new ECB, um, I guess the head, new head of the ECB the will, pursue better policies than his predecessor well yeah i mean you know it's not this is more hope it's not you know i to be honest <laughs> i don't think i'm pretty sure i never met draghi um you know i'm just basing this on that he's he's he has more his trainings in the united states and this is a case where the united states i think actually has an advantage over europe because in the united states you you learn Keynes. he went to uh, mit mm. at graduate school he studied with two very prominent keynesians uh robert solo paul samuelson um, he has to have seen Keynesian economics. And I, I've been kind of amazed in discussions I've had with European economists because even conservatives in the United States, now there's a small group of very, very conservative economists, but even, you know, most conservatives here, I'm thinking of like Martin Feldstein, who was, uh, President Reagan's chief economist for a period of time. They accept that the federal, the central bank could have a big impact on employment and output under certain circumstances. They, they're, going to be more concerned about inflation than, say, I would be. They'd be less concerned about unemployment. But they don't dispute that the central bank can have a big impact on employment and output, whereas a lot of Europeans, even fairly liberal progressive ones, often have this view that, you know, no, that just creates inflation. It's nothing to do with employment and output. And, you know, frankly, I find that mind-boggling. But that's that's a common yeah. view among yeah. Europeans. And in this case, although Draghi's obviously he's Italian, he's European, but he did have his training in the United States, so hopefully that's uh, that that that's uh, seeped in. Right. Yeah, we will have to hope, since it, as you say, it could lead to. I mean, we're probably. I mean, I would assume the United States is gonna is being affected no matter what. But obviously, a double dip, Lehman like situation um, would be very serious. Um, one question I've been. Uh, asking the economists that I've spoken with, several now, um, is that Paul Krugman had written, uh, I don't know, a year or two into the crisis, that he thinks that our economic system is inherent in, so, in, in important ways inherently unstable, that it can last about a generation or so, but not much longer. Do you do you agree with that, and do you feel like we can get a handle on it? I mean, I, I guess I feel, just from 
a layman's perspective that it's crashing more than we would like for it to. I think Joseph Stiglitz said, you know, a once every hundred year event is happening every decade. I think referring to the dot com and the housing bubble uh, burst. Well, I guess it depends what he means by the economic system. So, you know, we had a different, there are many different modes of capitalism. And we've had one that's been dominated by finance for increasingly over the last three decades. And I think that's a very, very bad path to go. I mean, finance is an intermediate good. No one, no one values finance in and of itself. I mean, it's not like, you know, we value shelter. You know, we want a nice home, comfortable home. You know, we value good food, you know, health care. These are all things we value in and of themselves. No one values finance in and of themselves. It's like trucking, you know, it gets, you know, you need it. You know, it's absolutely essential. You know, we want to save for our retirement. People need to borrow money for college, for a home, for a business. So you need a financial system. There's no doubt about it. But it's it, it should serve the productive economy. And we've really had a perversion over the last three decades where, Finance really has come to play a, pro, uh, a primary role where it's dominated the mm-hmm. productive economy. And that, I think, is certainly an unstable system. Um, mm-hmm. Can it continue? Um, I, I don't know what stops it. I mean, I sure hope it doesn't. But, you know, you could have, you know, events like we just did, you know, the collapse in 08. We, we could have that and by itself. That doesn't end the system. I mean, we might like it if it did, but it doesn't, you know. So, mm-hmm. so there's nothing to say, you know, let's say uh, – the economy more or less stabilizes over the next few years and then come 2015 or 18 or whatever, we get another crash and, you know, and then we stabilize again and then five years, you know, nothing's to prevent that, that I could see. I mean, you kind of hope that it doesn't happen in the sense that, you know, people rebel against and go, look, this is not the way things are supposed to be and we change it. But I don't think the system itself does that for you. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not a self stabilizing. It's not right. Um, and do you think we've done enough at this point? Do you think that Dodd-Frank does enough? Do you think we've done enough reform of the financial system to make it more stable in the future? No, not at all. I mean, you know, the things we've been talking about, there really has been, there hasn't been a fundamental change. The banks are basically operating as they did. They're still dominant in the, in the economy. Um, again, we should have, we should have been looking to break up the big banks. That was, you know, rejected. There was actually a bill, or I should say, an amendment that was proposed by uh, Brown from Ohio, Senator Brown and um, Kaufman, who was at the time the senator from, from Delaware, and, and it got, I think, it was 30 votes, and some of them were not real votes. I mean, in the sense that the people were up for election, and you know, they they knew it would be good for their election to say, "Oh, I want to break up the big banks." But if it had actually been a, a vote where it stood a chance of passing, they would have been on the other side. Um, my reason for mentioning this is just that it just shows you the power of the banks that, you know, that they couldn't even get 30 real votes for, for this bill, or maybe they got 30, but, you know, certainly not much more than that. So, you know, we would have wanted to see a break up of the big banks. Uh, you know, again, the. And part when of the- you say, <laughs> when you say break up, do you mean, uh, separate the commercial from the investment? I think both are wise. I mean, on the one hand, you have too big to fail banks, which what that means is that basically they're operating with a subsidy from the government. They're able to borrow at considerably lower interest than smaller banks because everyone knows that if Citigroup got into trouble, if Goldman Sachs got into trouble, the government would step in and bail them out. So you feel your money's more secure. You don't have to worry. Is Goldman doing something really risky? Well, maybe they are, but you know, the government's going to make good on, on Goldman's debt, so I don't care. So, so they're able to borrow at a much lower interest rate than smaller banks that might be focused on, you know, more normal, more, you know, mundane investments with lower risk. So on the one hand, we want to break them up for size. There shouldn't be too big to fail banks. The other is, yeah, I think a Glass-Steagall type separation is good. Right. Paul Volcker, the former Fed chair, of course, had said, well, we, we could cut it more narrowly. We'd let them stay together, but we wouldn't let them do proprietary trading, risky trading on their own account. What's happening now, and it's kind of predictable, you get into the rule writing and the industry people are all over it. There's very few people on the other side because, frankly, there's few people on our side that have the expertise to be there, time and expertise. So they're likely to get enough exemptions that, you know, basically they'll be able to do as much trading as they want. Um, the logic of separating commercial and investment banks was that commercial banks, of course, are insured by the government. Uh, you have, you know, most of us, we have money in a bank. It's insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It also has the support of the Federal Reserve, the idea being that 
there's a public interest in maintaining the banks as operating ongoing entities. So we're, we're safe. We have, you know, our 10,000 or whatever might be in the bank. Maybe it's 200, whatever it is. You know, we know we don't have to worry. So, uh, you know, and most of us would think that's a good thing because we don't want to have to, you know, review the bank's books to make sure they're not doing something stupid. I mean, that's, that's the logic of it. So you're, you're having the government come in and say, okay, there's, this is a good thing for the economy, for the public to have secure banks. But that's for doing sort of normal banking activities. Investment banking is inherently more risky. Investment banking is doing things like underwriting stock issues, bond issues. So I come in there with, uh, you know, pets.com and, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs underwrites that. So they're taking a really big risk. They're going to, they're going to give me, uh, $500 million as they go sell my shares. Well, maybe my shares aren't worth $500 million. So suddenly Goldman Sachs is out a lot of money. Um, so that's our classic investment banking. And then we have investment, what investment bankings are, are doing now, which is essentially doing the same thing that they're acting as hedge funds. They're just, you know, buying and selling, they're trading themselves not underwriting issues. They're just, you know, they're getting into gold, they're getting into silver, you know, buying this and that options and futures or credit default stuff. They're doing all sorts of things like that, which, you know, you're sort of inclined to go, fine, you want to do that, but that shouldn't be in any way guaranteed by the government. And when they tore down Glass-Steagall, they said, oh, don't worry, there'll be a separation. And I think what we're finding is, no, there is not a separation. Uh, the regulators, I mean, we're supposed to rely on the regulators to police this. They can't do it. So I think it's worth, um, as I say, both breaking up the banks in terms of making them smaller and also restoring that separation. So if that if an institution has deposit insurance, then what they're doing is sort of normal banking. They're making loans for small businesses, for student loans, for consumer loans, for for residential mortgages. That's what they're doing. They're not they're not speculating in credit default swaps. Right. And so okay, so. Breaking up the too big to fail banks, and then anything else in terms of what really needs to be accomplished in terms of um, state well, financial regulation tax would go a long way in downsizing the sector. I think that would really be a good thing. Um, there are a lot of smaller issues. One issue that comes up in reference to finance, but it really is throughout the economy, is that we have to rein in corporate management. Uh, corporate management has really been they basically hijack companies and you know it's not I'm not usually the biggest shareholder advocate they're not top on my list of oppressed minorities but you know it's it, you, you see a lot of cases where you know basically management is able to run the show for their own interest and mm -hmm. you know the obvious people to rein them in are, are the shareholders because they're being ripped off you know so you could look at some some examples from the financial crisis I mean if you're a shareholder in Lehman you're not happy you lost all your money Right. Uh, Richard, Stearns, the right. CEO walked away with two or three hundred million dollars. I mean, you can't be happy about that. He worked out deals for himself where he was just fine. He made tons and tons of money as as CEO of Lehman. Whereas, you know, while he put the shareholders, he he wiped out their money, and this used to be a valuable mm -hmm. bank ten years ago, but he wiped it out. Um, right. So, you know, and you, you know many other examples of the financial sector, but it's it's elsewhere as well. I mean, uh, recent example, Hewlett Packard, they fired their CEO. He done big bets with uh, getting an iPod imita iPad imitator, and it wasn't it really didn't sell very well. It lost him a lot of money. Um, other things he did as well, just was not very good in terms of building up the company's market, building up its profits. He walked away with somewhere around $20 million. So here's a guy that, you know, again, we could argue over CEO pay, and I'm not a fan of ICO pay, but when you do bad by a company, he's there for 19 months, I think it was. He gets paid over a million dollars to reduce their share value. Um, you have a real problem with with management structures. So I right. think, you know, I think that you know, again, it's it's most prominent in finance because that's where you see the most glaring examples where people just had incentives to take really big risks, and they were risk of this type: heads I win, tails you lose, and that that just is really bad. Right. Yeah, and this kind of all of this um, brings touches on a, another theme that's come up in my various interviews and that, that I think is prominent with the Occupy Wall Street movement, which is um, most of the economists I've talked to seem to think that we have a pretty good idea of what the problems are, how to fix them. We could come up with very specific legislation, but the problem is that we lack the political will because our system's been captured by these very powerful banking interests. So the, the problem really is more a political problem than an economic problem is the sense that I'm getting from the various people I talk to. 
That's exactly right, and that's you know why the the Occupy movement has really been so great because it, it has already had a big effect on the agenda. Because the agenda here in Washington was you know here you have all these people running around going, how can we reduce the deficit? Crisis, crisis, crisis. We have to reduce the deficit. And, you know here you have the super committee. They're prepared to make big cuts to Medicare, big cuts to Social Security, and you know they're they're ignoring. No one's talking about getting jobs. No one's talking about, you know, what are we going to do? We have all these people unemployed. Their families are breaking up. They're losing their homes. We don't have anyone talking about a remedy for that. We're talking about reducing the deficit that you just go, how is that a problem? And, right. you know, again, you know, I'm an economist. I'm happy to be rigorous about that. The financial markets are lending us money at incredibly low interest rates. So right. they're yelling, about, oh, my God, crisis, crisis. Well, if it's a crisis, we should have to pay real high interest rates, not real low interest rates. So, yeah, I mean, this is totally a, a issue of, you know, politics where from the vantage point of the people who control the political process, they're fine. You know, their, their profits are back to pre-recession levels. The financial industry's share of corporate profits is actually at a record high. Um, mm-hmm. bonuses on Wall Street are pretty much back to where they were. So, so they're going, everything's fine, you know, and you know, you'll hear, I mean, I don't think these are evil people in the sense that they're rubbing their hands going, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, 26 million, you know, they're not necessarily happy about that, but it's not, it's not causing them to lose any sleep. So right. the, their agenda is, oh, how can we fix this deficit situation that, you know, come however many years down the road, there could be a budget problem, might want to raise our taxes. And when you look at the crisis that we actually have today, it just, it, it's not a concern for them. Right. Right. So, yeah, I, and, and many people have said that they think that, you know, since the Occupy Wall Street movement in the last six weeks or month, that the agenda really has changed. Um, and it certainly has. I mean, if you go back, you know, I think a low point, and several people I talked to pointed this out, was during the debt ceiling crisis was probably one of the lowest points of this entire thing. That it's certainly, you know, what everybody's talking about now, just the fact that people feel compelled to come out and fight against uh, income inequality, you know, that there are income inequality denialists coming out of the woodwork. It really speaks, I think, to how much the conversation has changed. But then at the same time, um, when I hear the stuff coming, you know, from the super committee and and the kind of uh, ideas that seem to be coming from there, it doesn't appear that there's likely to be that much of a political change anytime very soon. Well, I think the first thing is to stop anything bad from happening. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're intent on cutting Social Security and Medicare. I should point out, President Obama had indicated he's willing to go along with that, you know, in, in the negotiations with Speaker Boehner around the debt ceiling. He, he indicated he was willing to go along with what I consider large cuts to Social Security. Raising the age of eligibility of Medicare to 67, which, you know, just be a nightmare. You know, I know people in their 60s who are, you know, dying for, you know, they'll hit 65 and then they have their, could be able to get affordable health care through Medicare. Because if you have a pre-existing condition, you're, you're literally talking about tens of thousands of dollars a year for insurance. No one can afford that. So you'd raise that to 67. It's just kind of incredible. Um, you know, and, and that's, of course, the Democratic position. I mean, it gets worse from there. So, right. so I think the main thing is to to prevent something like that from happening first and foremost, because you know, in principle they come out with their report this month, November twenty third, and then Congress is supposed to vote on it within I forget the exact date, but basically within a month. So it's a very short time frame. So at the very least, prevent something really bad from happening. But you know, again, if we get jobs on the agenda, and you know what what the great thing about you know the the Occupy Wall Street has been the resonance. This is spontaneous. I mean, it wasn't there, there was no you know, big organization that was saying, hey, go out and go, you know, occupy Oakland and L.A. And people did that of their own. And that just showed that, you know, people have the sense that this is this is right, you know, that, you know, things are not right in the country, that, you know, the, the top 1% are making out real well and everyone else is not. And that's not the way things should be. And right. that, that has had a response here, whether that's enough to, I mean, it's not going to change anything overnight. But it has changed the discussion. And again, the first thing is just stop something really bad from happening. And let's hope we can get jobs, get, you know, fixing the economy back actually on the agenda in Congress. Right. Right. I mean, do you, I mean, right now, the sense that I get is that it wouldn't be very hard for us to go into a double dip recession. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be, you know, it's real, the economy is very fragile. Um, so, if if there are serious cuts, it would be it could 
our economy could start contracting in a hurry. Is that your sense? No, I, I mean, I don't think we're likely to see a double dip, but I, I, I've been a little, a lot of people have been talking about double dips and it, 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 it's been a little bothersome because the, the story that we're seeing now is awful. And, you know, we just got jobs numbers out this month, uh, you right. know, for October came out this morning that we created 80,000 jobs. And that's horrible. I mean, you know, given where the economy is, what the shortfall is, we need somewhere in the order of 10 million jobs. That's how far down we are. Um, we need 90,000 jobs a month just to keep pace with the growth of the labor market. We didn't even keep pace with that this month. We did a little better last month, but, you know, we didn't even keep pace with it this month. So right. we should want to see three to 400,000 jobs a month. And the, the economy has done that. I mean, I say this to people, and I think like I'm pulling numbers out of the sky. I go, no, 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 I can show it to you. That's how many jobs right. a month we created back in 83 when we came out of a severe recession, 81, 82, and the same thing back in the in the 70s and 75 when we came out of a severe recession. We were creating jobs at 400,000 a month, you know, and that was a smaller economy, smaller labor force. So right. that's what we should want to see. So the idea that, oh, we're okay, and I've heard a lot of people saying that, oh, so you think things are okay? No, 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 no. It's, you know, yeah, it's better that we're growing 2 to 3% a year than we're shrinking. But that is not okay because we have a lot of ground we have to make up. And if we're just going to be sitting here growing 2 to 3% a year, creating, you know, 100,000 jobs a month, that's not doing it. So right. I see the basic story, you know, the, the baseline scenario as being a really, really bad scenario. It's better than a recession, but it's a horrible scenario. Yeah, I mean, I just spoke with Larry Michelle uh, yesterday, and he uh, had a new briefing paper out, or not too new, but a relatively recent briefing paper, you know, showing the numbers on the devastation of long-term mass unemployment, that it really devastates the economy for years and years to come. Um, and unless we do, did something massive, that's what we're looking at. So. Yeah, and, you know, the story is that, you know, and again, we have a lot of research on this, you know, as I know Larry's done some and others have as well, that when people are out of the labor force for long periods of time, they, they often end up becoming unemployable. I mean, employers don't, I mean, we're already seeing this. Right. You have employers that were actually saying, you know, if you're unemployed, don't bother to even apply, you know, but right. even if they aren't so, you know, even if they're not going to say that, you have a lot of employers, they look at your resume, well, you haven't been working for two years, we don't want you. And, People who tend to be on, who are unemployed a long time have a really, really hard time finding jobs. And in many cases, they may never get a job. Mm -hmm. So if we have people, obviously we already have a lot, we're going to get more the longer this drags on and we end up being out of work for a year and a half, two years. A lot of cases, these people may never work again. So it really is devastating. And, you know, the idea that we're just going to, you know, I hear people around Washington say, well, we're just going to have to tough it out. And I'm invariably going, what's this we jazz? You, are you unemployed? You know, um, right. you know, invariably the people employed are relatively well paying jobs and they're talking about toughing it out. They aren't toughing it out. They're doing just fine. You know, right. the people who are toughing it out, uh, probably have a different attitude. Right. Well, we should probably wrap up. We've gone, um, I could talk to you all day. This stuff is just fascinating. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add that we didn't cover? Um, well, I could go on forever, which you don't want me to do. I'm just trying to think if there's any really good things to, uh, like to, to get in there. Um, I think we've covered most of the obvious ones. Um, yeah, probably, probably, well, let me just mention one more thing that I think is really front and center that people don't, don't tend to focus on at all. And we, I, I did mention before, uh, you know, I was making, uh, Joke sort of about Mike, uh, Mike Consul, that he he seemed to have left out the deficit, trade deficit. Over the long term, we are going to have to get our trade closer to balance. I mean, that's it's. I'm not saying this is a moral issue; it's just a counting issue. That if if, if you if the government if the country has a trade deficit, it means we're net borrowers, which means that either the government has a budget deficit, a large budget deficit, or um, Private individuals are, are we're not saving, and neither of those is a very good story. At least not over the long term. Over the short term, it's not of consequence, but over the long term, it is. And, and that means getting the dollar down. And you know that that sounds strange to people. Like, why do you want the dollar down? But that is the that is the mechanism for adjusting a trade deficit. And that really should be something that you know people think about and talk about. And you know, again, that sounds strange to people. Like, you want a weak dollar. Um, I probably prefer the term competitive dollar. But if we're going to get if we're going to get uh, something closer to balanced trade, no magic to balanced trade doesn't have to be zero, you know. But but we're running very very large trade deficits, and we can't do that. And the way you adjust for that is getting the dollar down so that 
U.S. goods are more competitive both domestically and internationally. And that really should be something that we're talking about. Yeah, I, I haven't heard people talk about it much. And I, I did see you mention on a blog post and you mentioned it just with respect to, you know, coming out of our, what's becoming a lost decade that we're headed into. Um, and so, and how would we go about doing it? I mean, just inflation, just. Not, not first and foremost. I mean, what we really want to do is intervene in the currency markets uh, most immediately. I mean, we do have a number of countries. China's the most important, but we have other countries as well that are intervening to keep their currencies low against the dollar. And mm -hmm. what we really have to do is say that this isn't, you know, we don't want that policy. And, you know, ostensibly we are already doing that with China, but I've had conversations with people, including people in the administration. It's clear they're not serious about it because mm -hmm. When it, when it comes to the value of the dollar, they're, they're, they're different interests. So manufacturing workers certainly want to see a lower value dollar. That improves their position vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, foreign produced goods. So they definitely want to see a lower value dollar. And I would say that's pretty much the interest of the country as a whole. But you have interest. The financial industry doesn't want to see a lower value dollar. They're looking to invest in China and other countries. The higher the value of the dollar, the further their money goes. Um, also, you have uh, you have the chain retailers, Walmart being the most obvious one, but they've all done this. They've set up supply chains to China and other countries that are dependent on getting very cheap goods, and that, that's their competitive advantage. They've spent the last two decades building up these supply chains. So they don't want to see those supply chains suddenly become of less value because, you know, the dollar's fallen 20 or 30 percent against the Chinese currency. So I think a position of the, the Obama administration and probably the Bush administration as well when uh, President Bush was in office was that, you know, they don't they don't really want the dollar to fall. They're not going to push China on it because, you know, they're kind of happy with, with it as it is. But I think, you know, we have to understand that for, for most of us who, you know, unless you're a really big shareholder in Goldman Sachs or, or Walmart, um, you probably do want to see the dollar fall. And, mm -hmm. you know, that really has to be part of the agenda because otherwise we're not going to get anything resembling balanced trade. Um, we're going to see we, we've lost in the last decade somewhere in the order of 7 million manufacturing jobs. I don't know we're getting all of them back. We might get 3 or 4 million back if we got something closer to balanced trade. That would have a very big impact on the economy. So this really should be, you know, something that people see as being part of a progressive agenda. Right. Have you written about that? Is there something I can link? I should have things on the website about it. I'm in the middle of trying to do a little longer piece on it. I certainly have blog notes. I have a lot of blog notes. Okay. Okay. And okay. I think in, in some of the pieces I wrote on stimulus, I think I've included some discussion of that as well. Right. Well, you're going to uh, – yeah, I, like I said, I haven't heard much about it. And, in fact, I mean, it's always a right-wing talking point about, you know, they'll start screaming about debasing the currency and this type of thing. So I'm sure you're going to get lots of reaction if you start pushing that idea, um, which, good. Uh, so very interesting. Um, and look forward to, if you are if you are going to be writing more on that, I look forward to seeing that. I hope that that does, you know, I think in general trade hasn't been very front and center. Trade imbalances haven't been very front and center with progressive economists. And I look forward to somebody addressing those issues because they seem to be getting worse and worse. Yeah, no, it is a deal. I should mention, it is, I do have a chapter in my book, uh, the Loser oh. Liberalism book, so it is, it, I do have it there. I know I wrote about it somewhere. Just don't <laughs> good, good. Well, I will make sure to link that, the Amazon, um, to your recent book. And and how, when was that book? Was it post This came out at the end of, the end of uh, August. Oh, okay. Okay, so really new. Yeah, because I noticed, I mean, you write books incredibly quickly. I think you had two books about the crisis since the crash. Is that right? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, when you think of stuff and, you know, a lot of stuff I've been writing on for a long time, so it doesn't take that long to put it into a book. Right. Well, very good. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us, and I will make sure to link your book, and and, and maybe I'll email you and try to get some of those blog posts. Okay, um, great. That'd be great. So thank you so much. And sure, we will thanks talk a lot. to you Enjoy. soon. Bye-bye. Okay.